A lot of people put off personal and professional development because it takes time. And it's in that, you know, to use the Johari window, you know, it's in that important but not urgent category that we often squeeze down to virtually nothing. And so when I think about my own schedule, which often is very busy, if I don't invest the time, it's never going to happen. So I say if personal development is important to you, professional development is important to you, the whole area of intercultural intelligence should be on your list. And therefore, it's just a matter of not if you do it, but when. Welcome to the Cultural Agility Podcast, where we explore the stories of some of the most advanced intercultural practitioners from around the world to help you become culturally agile and succeed in today's culturally complex world. I'm your host, Marco Blankenberg, International Director of KnowledgeWorks, where every day we help individuals and companies achieve relational success in that same complex world. So... This podcast series is all about intercultural and intercultural intelligence, cultural agility, whatever you want to call it. And I'm really excited that uh, Paul White and Matt Trencher could join us today in a conversation around their life's journey, their professional journey. We sort of have a list of questions, but we don't know where this conversation will lead us. So thank you for joining. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, I've known the two of you in one way for a very long time. In other ways, professionally, we've drifted in and out of each other's world. And for the sake of our listeners, it would be great if you can uh, introduce yourself to uh, to our podcast listeners. Sure, uh, I can go first. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Matt Trenchard. Um, I'm from the UK originally, now living in Dubai since 2006, which shocks me, like how long I've been here. Didn't never expect to be here almost 15 years. I'm the co-founder of North Point Academy, which... Uh, at its core, teaches people to be coaches, but we see that more as a vehicle for actually about helping people go through transformation. And we kind of come, came across intercultural intelligence through our relationship with you, and we've loved the journey that we've been on. I'm looking forward to the conversation. So thank, thank you. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, thank you. Paul. Yeah, my name is Paul William White, and I give you my middle name because I have a number of very famous namesakes, one being the Jungle Doctor author. If any of you are really old, you'll know that. So that's not me. Um, I was born in New Zealand. I uh, married an Australian and I moved to Dubai 20 years ago. My kids are confused because they don't know which country they come from half the time, although they really do come from here. So 20 years in Dubai, I started off as a chartered accountant and I went through career change 10 years ago and uh, became a professional coach. And that's how I got involved with Matt. I work alongside with Matt in North Point Academy. And I've also done a lot of work with people in career transition. Mm, wonderful. And now I know why William. I knew it was William, Paul, but now I know why. <laughs> Although for me, you are the most famous one I know. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> awesome. So in some way... Of course, our, our journey through life, which involves cultural elements, mm. and um, since that's what we're focusing on today, I'm just curious, when did the intercultural side of life, when did that start <laughs> to come alive for you? I'm sure that it's not just your professional life. I'm sure there are other moments in your, in your history, your journey. You look embarrassed, Matt. No, I'm not embarrassed. I'm laughing, though. Oh, maybe maybe I'm embarrassed as well. Um, I feel like I've cut you off your question, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Yeah, go for it. Um, <laughs> so I think for me, the intercultural world came alive to me um, when my wife and I attended a intercultural marriages program. Mm. Um, led by one of your friends and colleagues and, and his wife, uh, Julia? Julie. Yeah, Julie. Um, we'd already been exposed on, on some level, but just those sessions, they, they had my wife and I they afterwards just talking through situations from her background, from my background, but then also like from other, like she'd be like, oh yeah, this person at work. And we just ended up talking through other people's lives, our own lives, and just like, ah, oh, shine that light, shine that light, shine that light. Things mm. become more clearer. Ah, oh, that explains why that. Mm. So that's kind of how it all began to spark in my life. Great, great. How about you, Paul? 
was probably many times, but probably the one time, especially here in the Gulf, was when I was visiting a Gulf national and um, drinking their delicious coffee. And I was on to my fifth cup. Now, if anyone knows anything about golf uh, traditions, you'll realise that by the time you get to your third, you should have stopped and you should shake your hand. Well, nobody had told me this. So I just kept putting my cup back. And um, my friend was very gracious and pointed out what had happened. <laughs> but on reflection, that was like, oh, I have no idea what I'm doing here. Mm. And uh, did you sleep that night? <laughs> <laughs> I've never slept since that happened. <laughs> Still embarrassed. So um, you both are involved professionally with people. Mm. And that's that's the direction your career has taken you. Very uh, much so. Um, and when you think about the work you're involved with, the life you lead, uh, in which way was intercultural intelligence attractive? Why were you drawn into it? And what caused you to pursue it further? <laughs> I think for me, um, multiple levels. One, you know, on the intellectual, just kind of ah, oh, like it's a way, it, it's a map, um, it's a a way of understanding the world. But also, as we, as we and I got more into it, the realization that ah, oh, it could help me understand me better. And then as a result, like oh, okay, this is how it applies to coaching. Mm. Because when the coach understands themselves better, they can help their client to understand themselves better and therefore be more you know, effective or whatever they need to be in their in the, in the coachee's life. Yeah. So we saw it as adding a, an extra, um, what's this, the phrase, a feather to our bow, or well, that's not the wrong phrase, but yeah, an extra level to, our, to what we're doing. I think it's a feather in your cap. Man. Feather in your cap, yeah. or arrow, in your, arrow in your quiver. There we go. Getting your metaphors mixed up. Yeah. Here we are, Australian English and British English. Except and, I'm actually born in New Zealand. <laughs> so Dutch. <laughs> Gotta love the Dutch. Yeah. For me, uh, Marco, it's quite different. Um, you know, I've known you for a very long time. And when we first met in Dubai, I asked you what you did and found out this intercultural thing. I thought, oh, that's interesting. So ever since then, I've really been tracking what you, you're doing and seeing how the methodologies and the processes have matured. And I mean, I first met you when you and some of your colleagues were on a DISC certification, professionally at least. So I decided to engage in this kind of professionally once I'd watched for a while and seen that it stood the test of time. Actually, also, I felt like it was overdue because, like, I'd known you for so long and I <laughs> knew some of the stuff that you'd been doing. So it was like, yeah, I actually need to take this on board. Mm. Um, so I knew of it before coaching, but it has acute relevance for people working with people, mm. especially. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think I'll add that I think I recognized how different the ICI work was from some of the other kind of cultural or cross-cultural yeah, work that I'd seen. A lot of it seemed to be like identifying, kind of like separating, like putting things apart, putting things in boxes. And the result was, was just, to, just to see how we're all different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As opposed to the ICI work, which is much more internal, much more how we similar or how we different. And then based on that, how can we begin to step across what from one area into the other? And mm, So mm. I, I, I found it much more the potential for bridging divides was much greater. Right, right. Of course, the reality with, with stepping into the world of intercultural intelligence, because it is indeed, it starts with you mm. and a very inside-out approach. There are very few people who are not impacted by that in a profound way. Mm. Uh, so I'm curious for you, as you started to learn more about initially maybe the mechanics and the terminology and the system behind intercultural intelligence, how has it changed you or impacted you? Yeah, look, I thought about this question. I think it's on three levels. Um, firstly, just myself and my own relationships. It's just helped me to change the way I approach people. I think it's fair to say. And then more closely related to me, myself, it's helped me be more aware of my own worldview. And, and of course, um, North Point's coaching methodology also embraces this term worldview. They're thinking more from a philosophical worldview point of view. You're obviously talking from a cultural 
well, view point of view. Mm. So, I mean, this was one area where I was really quite shocked at how monocultural I was, even after living here for quite some time. Mm. So that's really changed me. And then, surprise, surprise, it has had a, a significant impact and continues to have an impact on the way that I coach, mm. Um, mm. just because when you consider people as unique cultural beings, it changes the way that you approach them and the assumptions that you have to correct because we all make them. The bias that we bring in, we reevaluate it and we put it on the table, both on both sides of the table. So it has a lot of implications. Mm -hmm. And the ICF, the new ICF competencies take take this whole the area. ICF is International Coach Federation. Federation, thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. They have taken this a lot more seriously recently and they've just revised their core competencies and we see their, this area being more richly addressed in the upcoming revision, which is due for release quite soon, I believe. Now, you mentioned something that, that's uh, part of the terminology of, of the intercultural intelligence framework. Uh, to treat every human being as a uniquely wired cultural human being. What in the world does that mean? <laughs> Good spot. <laughs> That's your question, man. <laughs> I'm still on the previous question, Paul. Paul we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> no, no, isn't the first question. Just for the sake of our listeners, I want to make sure that we don't lose people along. Oh, no, no, I can, I, can, I can address this. Back to what Matt said before, some other frameworks that we've been exposed to tend to kind of categorize people, which is helpful. You know, if you pigeonhole people, it helps you to classify the world and make sense of it. But unfortunately, what happens with culture is people take that far, far further than it should, was ever intended, I think, to go. And so this term about people who are culturally unique or culturally wired refers to the fact that we are all unique because our, all of our cultures are different because we come from different families, different countries, different regions of different countries, different cities, different villages. There's many cultural influences. So to put us in a box can be quite a dangerous thing. And so it's a positive recognition of that. It's a curious, it's, a, it's an encouragement to be curious when we approach people because we realize that this person is a, a one-off. So let's explore that. How, mm. how can they be better at who they are? This kind of stuff from a coaching perspective. So it's, a, that's, it's quite a shift. As both of you mentioned, the traditional way of looking at culture is where are you from, which passport mm. you carry, to yeah. the, every person is unique. Every, yeah, mm. every person is unique. And yet, and this really matches with, with the way that we work and coach as well, that although we're all unique, we're all more similar than we are different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they... Although I can think of it in terms of maybe um, three colors of paint mm -hmm. and they all get mixed together and make a unique color. Right. But it's three colors of paint mm -hmm. in different quantities that get mixed together. Yeah. And we'll come back to that. How does that impact the way you engage clients, mm -hmm. coaches in your work? We'll come back to that. But uh, let's stick to the personal level. Yeah. So, you asked me how it impacted me. Yeah. 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 So... Um, I think part of my life story is that I grew up and have remained pretty flexible to other people. Mm -hmm. I think that served me pretty well uh, as I was growing up. But then as I've got older, it's become more important, actually, particularly when coaching, not to be so flexible that, you know, that I don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. So my journey has been about, well, like, what am I? And so you know, I was learning, or I have learned through the ISO work about my own cultural makeup learned that I'm also, like Paul, pretty monoculture in that way. I haven't really felt a need to adjust that or because for me it's been like, ah, oh, okay. So that that places me within this, particularly in, in Dubai, places me within this multicultural context. Mm. I'm still uh, flexible, engaging with other people, but now with an additional thing, like, okay, I know where I am, let's discover where someone else is. Mm. Mm. We sometimes use the word anchoring. Mm. Um, would that connect with what you just mentioned? Or Yeah, I would think so. For all my flexibility, there's a need for me sometimes to be, be more grounded. Mm -hmm. And so the more I can know who, who I am, right. how I'm made, mm. it, it grounds me more, it anchors me more. Yeah. So yes. Yeah, yeah. Now, both of you indicate that this is not just intellectually stimulating or fun mm. this is actually helpful mm. uh, it, uh, it changes how I do life mm. um, on all fronts 
Um, I'm just curious, do you have any examples off the cuff of, of real life situations where ICI either uh, the lack of it mm -hmm. caused a messy situation or the, the existence of it or your, your ability to apply it saved mm -hmm. the day, for instance? Anything that comes to mind? Yeah. Um, one from home. I'm try trying to choose examples which are safe to share. Um, <laughs> because my, you guys know, the listeners don't, so my wife's from a, a different culture to me. So we had a particular situation where um, she wasn't feeling so good for dinner. She had to said, I'm, I'm not going to have dinner. We'd eaten dinner the, the night before, and there was some dinner left over. And so I said, I, I, it's, it's okay, it's okay. I'll just go and make myself a sandwich. It's fine. You look after yourself. She takes offense. And I'm really, really thrown by this. And I think we both understood enough of this work, so this is a positive story, that I was able to ask her, okay, okay hey, I'm, I'm missing this here. Can you tell me what's going on? And she was able to go one next step further and tell me, hey, I made that food for you and now you don't want it. Now I know what, okay. So I realized that actually it's about she was trying to honor me and I wasn't returning the honor. Mm -hmm. So I was able to say to her, oh, I understand, but can I explain from my perspective? I wanted us to have that meal that you'd cooked yesterday, which we thought we'd have today. Because you're not feeling well, we'll have it tomorrow together. And for me, that's me honoring you by making sure we have it together and I just have a sandwich now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It changed everything. Right, right. And if I hadn't had the ICI, I wouldn't have known how to walk that road. Yeah. You used the term earlier on shining a light on mm. a situation. Yeah. Uh, to me, it sounds like both of you, because you know, in this case, the three colors of worldview framework, yeah. you're able to turn that spotlight on mm. and it, it helped you move forward. Well, it diffused the whole situation. Yeah. Because it shifted it. It wasn't about the food. It was actually about honor and respect. Yeah. Any examples that come to mind, Paul? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's many examples of living here, probably in the same space in terms of honour and shame. But probably more recently for me, the influence of, you know, to talk three colours of worldview language, the influence of power fear is something that I was not sure of what it actually meant. You know, I had these images in my mind of, you know, witch doctors, you know, <laughs> standing around casting spells on their tribes and, you know, it's, it's not it's not about that. Um, and I, I think I really, I've probably witnessed it more now than I've actually experienced it, but I've just seen particularly in organisations as well as in cultures, um, power fear can, mm. the, 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 the domain of power fear, the, the sphere of power fear can be seen as a very negative thing, and often it is, but also it can be quite positive. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I, I think one of our in, intents in, in organisations is to empower people, which is the, was the light side, is the positive side of, of power fear, and to actually just to see smaller changes in people's lives. You know, uh, I'm just trying to think of a specific example where where perhaps they change the way they engage with their staff. And I mean, I have to be careful with not giving specifics away here, but just so that they they are actually more engaged rather than kind of dictatorial. Mm. Um, you can't change the way you kind of are personally. Mm. You know, your personal style is maybe something that's more difficult to change, but you can change the way that you interact with people um, if you're conscious of these kind of things. So I think for me, that's the area where I've seen the, most visible manifestation recently. It's interesting you mentioned that because uh, even this morning I had a conversation with a client where we've had the privilege of working with them throughout the 2020, mm -hmm. the first COVID year. And uh, one of the issues that they were facing was along the same lines of what you were just saying, that um, leaders found it hard to create a, a safe, open space for their staff. Mm -hmm. and. And if that happened, staff didn't feel confident and free to step into that space mm. to voice their opinion, talk about what they were struggling with. And, and, and today the HR director was saying that has totally changed. Oh, fantastic. Uh, where, where leaders are seeing their position of power not as a, a place where they decide 
who's going to speak and who's not going to speak, um, as opposed to using that power to uh, to actually open the space and say, yeah. hey, let's talk about what's real for you and what you're mm. struggling with and what, what, what we mm. need to change together. Yeah, So that's a great example yeah. from a, of, of a positive shift in the way they look people look at power. Yeah, thanks for bringing that in, because what you're talking about is relates to what we do as well, because mm. it, it's a shift in in the direction of communication mm -hmm. from a, hey, what to do, to a more coaching style, which is right. I invite. Yeah. Um, and I, in, in my experience, um, senior leaders, particularly in organizations where there is a strong power fear, they themselves fear what would happen if they stopped doing what they were doing. Mm. And uh, the work that Paul and I and the rest of the team do actually tells them, okay, so if you're going to let go of this kind of power, here's another way that you can exercise your power. Yeah. But in a way that is then more empowering. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about letting go and letting it all go to, to bits. To bits. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Now you've referred to the work you're involved with several times already. Um, but just a quick summary, North Point... What do you guys do? Where do you guys work? And uh, how does that impact the world? What do we do? Um, I don't think I'll, I'll jump for taglines, but... Um, uh, I can do that. <laughs> you can, yeah. Um, but on, on a... Uh, corporately, when a corporate comes to us, for example, they're wanting us to help them help their managers become better leaders. Mm -hmm. And often that's through uh, helping them shift from command and control mm -hmm. to being more open, being more um, collaborative, asking better, better questions, helping to empower other people. And all of these things are coach skills. Mm -hmm. and so what we also do is we train individuals and teams around how to be coaches. Mm -hmm. And all of that is founded in a body of knowledge and a body of wisdom, which is all around, hey, let's find out what's inside and how can we bring what's inside outside? How can we lower our, our guards and actually be more vulnerable, show people who we are? And as you were saying earlier, by doing so, create safe spaces where others can also be vulnerable and therefore we can all be more human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can I drop the taglines now? Go right ahead. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> so recently, um, North Point Academy has kind of changed their vision a bit and their vision now is to build transformational communities from the inside out. So mm -hmm. it's talking more about what, from Matt's point of view, is... is is living from the inside out, looking inside how, how that impacts your external behaviour and then taking that into a community setting where you, everyone is more open and collaborating together and changing the, the communities and organisations they're a part of. So it's it's more than, it sounds a bit stereotypical, but it's more than a coaching company. Um, it's more than a provider of coach training. Now I'm going to drop the other one. <laughs> Because it really, I mean, I, I love this. It, it really helps people in their organization or in a personal context get awake to themselves and alive to others. So that's the other table. Mm. But I, I like that. Yeah. Great. And then you asked, where are we? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I'm, we're in, in a podcast booth, I think. We are, we are. But <laughs> where, where, where is North Point? Well, as of 2020, we're everywhere. Right. Because we're a bit virtual. <laughs> You're amazing, man. <laughs> but where do, we, where, where do we base ourselves? Well, there's a bunch of us in UAE, um, and there's a small number of us in UK. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But to your point, how, how has COVID changed your go-to-market? You said we're everywhere. Yeah. Well, I think it's probably safer to say how is it changing, because mm. it's still a change. I mean, it's taken all of our work online. Mm. Um, it's now taking more of our, our marketing and sales work online. But yeah, so that's been the big shift. Yeah. Uh, I remember reading quite early on in, in the in the pandemic, so we're looking at kind of April, May time, already people are saying that like health issues aside, mm -hmm. this thing, this situation has accelerated the direction that both companies and learning was already going five, ten years faster than it would have done anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Now, North Point existed before we started to engage with ICI. Mm. Um, so there was a version of North Point coaching, the certification to become a coach existed before ICI was sort of brought into that same space. How has intercultural intelligence shifted the way you look at coaching, the way you train people to mm -hmm. become coaches, the way you engage with your clients? 
I think it's fair to say the core mm. tr- coach training program that, that North Point offers has not changed in content, but this is a very loud voice into that content because actually what what the whole methodology of North Point, as we talked about before, does is, is, is ask you to look inside out. So when you look, you look inside yourself, many people don't do that. So it gives you another very strong, rich lens to look inside of yourself and then obviously to look at other people. So I think in, in the core training, coach training we do, it, it's it's woven in there more as we do it more. I think it's impacted our corporate work in a, in a more significant way because it's helped us to engage with clients with more understanding and respond to their needs better because we understand where they're coming from as well as what they think they need. And we have seen an opportunity, which of course, Marco, we've all worked on together to extend and deepen our coach training. So we've then gone on and built another course on top of the certification, Mm -hmm. which is a certificate of intercultural coaching, which can help people to keep themselves current for their CCEUs for the ICF, which is continual education for ICF credential coaches. And also it can be used as coach training hours to go to the next level yeah. of certification, yeah. which is... Um, I'll, I'll come back to, to mm. the certificate in intercultural yeah. coaching because I think that's a very exciting project that we worked on together. Yeah. But Matt, you were one of the founders of North Point. Yeah. So I can build on what Paul's saying. I yeah. mean, like I think one thing that ICI did for us is it in some ways showed us why we were already attracting people from a great variety of cultures already. Yeah, it's true. Mm. Even before we were involved, it was like, hey, we're not trying to do this, but in a typical room, we're having a couple of Emiratis and some people from Europe and just like a real mixed set of people right from the beginning. And I think for us, what ICI did was show us like, ah, okay, so actually there's a real mesh. Mm-hmm. And actually, not just a real match between the two ideas, but both of these ideas are actually fitting with how reality really is. Mm-hmm. I think what it's also done for us is it's helped us with our kind of engagement with the market when we're speaking to people. Right. So it's not just about like, kind of like yes, do you want to do it or not? In some ways, it helps us see a, a kind of a longer picture, a longer journey, how people are engaging along the way. Mm-hmm. And Paul, you already uh, jumped into the fact that the collaboration has gone to the extent that we created the Certificate of Intercultural Coaching together. Now, if I was even thinking about coaching or maybe I have extensive experience in coaching, the world of coaching by and large is, is sort of um, infused with a, a psychological perspective on humanity. There's a lot of psychological thinking in the world of coaching mm. um, and, and coaching has existed for quite a lot of years. Why bother with infusing the intercultural stuff into somebody who's already a good coach? Why do they need it? <laughs> so I'm just laughing at your question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I'd probably pull on some of what you told us before, um, from just from a strictly ICI perspective, Marco, that people are already living cross-culturally, interculturally more than ever before. That's likely just to only increase. And actually... The pandemic has just made that more and more. Although we're not actually moving around as much physically, work, working-wise, virtually, we're working with people from all over the world. Mm. And uh, if I don't know what drives me, I mean, for me, this is almost like a universal truth. If I don't know what what is driving me or what to me is about me, I'll very likely point it out there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, erroneously. So actually, hey, if I can know about my own cultural makeup, uh, then when someone's different, I know that it's not that they're wrong or that I can see me and then I can go, okay, so this is different. So now I'm curious. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not criticizing. I'm not a critic. Mm. I'm like, hey, so, so what's going on there for you? And just one, uh, being curious is one of the, the, the grand um, talents coach just to help both themselves and others get curious about what's going on learn from it rather than shut down thinking by being critical Mm, yeah Yeah, look for me when i started thinking about the influence of ici on coaching there's kind of three things it's it's not exclusively this but there's three ways to think about about intercultural factors influencing coaching specifically it's the coach 
it's coachy and it's the topic of coaching. Mm. So Matt was talking about how um, his own culture impacts or cultural blindness impacts his ability to interact with other people effectively. Mm. So that's super important because you may just completely miss things as a coach if you don't see them, which is sounds incredibly obvious as we say, but it, it can happen very, very easily. Or, you know, like I, I wear corrective lenses. So if we wear lenses that that distort the way we see things, then again, we, we may completely miss the true meaning of what's going on in a coaching relationship simply because of who we are, nothing to do with the coach. Mm-hmm. coaching. On the coachee side of things, to bring these frameworks in into this thinking can can bring a whole new world to someone if they haven't thought it through, or if they have actually been influenced by this kind of thinking before, then you're basically playing on the same ground. Mm. And so then the insight that can be realized is is shared because you have a mutual understanding of how culture operates. Um, so, so that's the coach and the coachee. And then, of course, there's the topic. Well, this one is probably more obvious because there's a lot of consultancy, you know, done on situations, you know, consultants are employed to look at situations, people look at situations. So we're used to looking at things from the outside and therefore, you know, we can see cultural influences affecting the way people engage and do business and how successful or unsuccessful they are. But I think that one, the last one, is probably the one that we're the most aware of and therefore the one that we Well, it's not that we need to pay the least attention to it in coaching, but we probably need to be more cognizant of the individuals involved first before we look at the situations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To give you like some some examples. So I remember earlier in my coaching career, coaching an Emirati gentleman. And as I'm coaching, in my mind, I'm thinking, man, it's like he's circling around and not actually talking about the issue at hand. And also thinking, (laughs) like... um, it's like he just doesn't really know what he wants. So I remember thinking that I wasn't, I hadn't been very effective. I didn't know why. Having done ICI and coached subsequently and looked back, I realized that actually I, he didn't have sufficient trust with me that we hadn't yet built enough of a trust between us for him to allow himself to open up to me and tell mm. me really what was going on. Mm. And also when it came to making decisions, he actually wanted, he needed to, to think through who, who he was going to speak to, who, who in his community was important to speak into his life to, to help him make decisions. Mm. And I was kind of blindly pushing him towards us to make decisions mm. because of where I come from, which is much more about this is what I want to do because we, I come from a more individualistic society. Mm. Mm-hmm. So then translate that into a, a coach mentoring session I was doing a few months ago. And we had a, um, a Saudi national on that coach mentoring group call. And a very similar topic came up. And it was, for me, a joy to hear from him, him describing that, like, yeah, be, what he would do was he would ask someone else, mm-hmm. ah, so who, who would you go and speak to? And what would you like to get from that? Who is it important in your community? Mm-hmm. And so hearing this someone from a very similar cultural background, expressing that, me re- realising the mistakes that I made, that helped me understand, ah, okay, so this is what I see I can do to, to add to my coaching. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're referring to one of the 12 dimensions that we use, um, community accountability versus individual accountability. Mm. And it seems just from the story you just told that if you as a coach would continue to operate purely based on an individual accountability mm. versus your coachee being more from a community accountability point of view, what would happen if you would have never discovered that? I would continue to, to find it difficult to help my coaches to make decisions and move forward. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, we've talked about coaching. We, we talked a little bit about the, um, the fact that we created a program. I think all three of us are quite excited about the fact that the Certificate in Intercultural Coaching exists. Uh, it's... Uh, these types of certifications, they, they take a lot of time and energy mm. and resources. If you had a chance to say to people in the audience, this is why you should consider investing this and in this, what would you say to them? Uh, for me, I'm, I'm originally a finance guy, right? So I cut my teeth in chartered accountancy, 
And so I'm not sure I think about money a lot, but I certainly think about how you measure things. And I think about investment. So a lot of people put off personal and professional development because it takes time. And it's in that, you know, to use the Johari window, you know, it's in that important but not urgent category that we often squeeze down to virtually nothing. And so when I think about my own schedule, which often is very busy, if I don't invest the time, if I don't set the time aside and actually keep it that way, it's never going to happen. It's not even a money thing, to be honest. It's, it's, it's about time because time is arguably one of the most valuable resources that we have mm. in the world, perhaps along with water. So I, I say if personal development is important to you, professional development is important to you, the whole area of intercultural intelligence should be on your list. And therefore, it's just a matter of not if you do it, but when. Mm. 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 Marco, for me, I'd speak to coaches who have a real desire to be the best coach they can be. Mm -hmm. And just to say that um, if you're dealing with people from other cultures, so that's if you're dealing with anyone online outside your own uh, country, if you're living outside your own country, any of those sorts of situations, and if you're wanting to be the best coach you can be, this is a big step forward. Mm. Um, it's not actually an easy step forward. It's not an easy step forward because the big chunk of it, and in some ways this is the same with all coaching development, the big chunk of it is the self-development. And we often say um, in, in the academy that it's the, the, the self-learning, the self-knowledge of the coach, which is far more important really than any of the, the tools and, and, and the techniques. And mm. you know, what, what ICI does is give a big bright light on a new area. And so, yeah, if that's you, if you're wanting to be the best coach you can be, uh, you can't really go wrong with this. Mm. Well, thank you. I would like to uh, sort of uh, wrap us up. We have a, had an interesting year behind us. That's 20, one word for it. One word for it. <laughs> Challenging. <laughs> um, there's 2021 is already one month in. Mm. And uh, we have, of course, very little insight as to what this year is going to be. But I'm curious, when you think about this year, what, what do you get excited about? Mm. I can go first, so I'll start with a couple of trivial ones. Um, I'm looking forward to traveling again. I mean, I haven't been on an aeroplane since uh, January last year, and I love to travel. Mm. So, But there's no end in sight for that just yet for a number of reasons. So um, I'm a passionate Liverpool um, supporter, so I'm really <laughs> hoping Liverpool goes head-to-head. And I have a friend who's a Man United fan who's already spitting tax, as I say that. I hope he's listening. Hi, Martin. And, yeah, but seriously, for me, it's really hard to know what to look forward to in 2021 because the world has changed so much. And we've really been taught a big lesson in 2020 to not plan too far ahead. And so, you know, I, I am looking forward to engaging with my clients this year, but that's every year. Um, but I've, I've really held myself back this year quite a lot because I just don't necessarily know what's going to happen this year. Mm -hmm. We don't know how long the pandemic is going to, you know, if you like, hold the world in its grip, you know. So it may be we have the same conversation in 12 months' time. We just don't know. Mm -hmm. So probably for me, it's, it's making the best of what I have in front of me, mm -hmm. which can, can be a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think from my side, Personally, yeah, looking forward to, to traveling. I'd love to go and see my family in UK at some point. Um, it's been quite some time. Um, I think professionally, we're looking forward to, uh, although things haven't changed that much, I think we're all a bit more used to this disruption than we were. So it kind of feels like, you know, God willing, business is going to be up on last year. Mm. If I stand back, though, from the whole thing, and I look at trends. I think it's probably easier to speak about trends rather than just 2021. Mm. Um, I think this shift that we've seen into virtual work is going to continue. I think the shift towards people working home might shift back a bit, but that's here to stay. Mm. Mm. And then also politically, like I went to a, um, a talk given by one of the Sharjah Sheikhs recently. He's an economist. Yeah, and... and uh, it's like we're, uh, there's a lot of hidden corruption in the world that's going to come to the surface. Mm. And that's going to be a big upset for us for, for a number of years. We're already seeing some of those things taking place. 
So I think it's going to be a very VUCA world to continue. <laughs> yeah, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. Mm. Um, so that actually gives me great hope for the work that all of us do. Because if I'm going to live in a world that's increasingly like that, increasingly volatile, I've got to know who I am and where I am and how I can navigate a very complex environment. And that's mm. what we do. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation Me too. with the two of you. Uh, I, wish, I wish we had more time. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll re do a, a part two later on uh, <laughs> in the series. Bring it on. Even just uh, talking about coaching specifically, I think mm. it could be very, very interesting um, to uh, talk about, well, what does it look like to bring intercultural coaching techniques uh, into a relationship? But uh, thank you so much for making the time. And uh, we are looking forward to, uh, to our partnership and working together in, in 2021. So mm -hmm. uh, lots to look forward to in this challenging year ahead of us. Keep doing the good work you're doing, Marco. Thanks yeah, very much. Thanks, Marco. Thank, you. thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the Cultural Agility Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, share it with someone. The best way to help us out is by leaving a review on your favorite podcast app or channel, or forward and recommend this podcast to people around you. As always, if any of the topics we discussed today intrigue you, you will find links to articles discussing them in greater depth in the podcast notes. If you would like to learn more about intercultural intelligence and how you can become more culturally agile, you can find more information and hundreds of articles at knowledgeworks.com. A special thanks to Jason Carter for composing the music on this podcast and to the whole KnowledgeWorks team for making this podcast a success. Thank you, Nita Rodriguez, Ara Azizbekian, Rajitha Raj, and thanks to Vip and George for audio production, Rosalind Raj for scheduling, and Caleb Strauss for marketing and helping produce this podcast. <laughs>